she must seek out a new and a novel experiences, especially in a dangerous situation, to fulfill her need. Damn. Now you see, with clarity, my peculiarity, my regular vulgarity, my animal barbarity, I'm just in a phase where earth and lust can occur, and I'll break into any house to find some fur. <laughs> old ladies have good stories, but mine is better than most. You see, I was Little Red Riding Hood. Yes. People all over the world have heard about how I set off in the woods in a red cloak bearing a basket of goodies from my grandmother. It's funny though, nobody ever asks what became of Little Red Riding Hood. No one asks what happened after she emerged from the hot sticky furnace of the wolf's belly and was forced to watch as the huntsman filled him with stones. It was a gruesome thing. The huntsman kept carrying them in, armful after armful, from Granny's garden. He made me hold the wolf's front paws while Granny held the back. And even after the wolf was full of stones, still he brought in more, laughing as he shoved them around the wolf's heart and onto his slick liver, smiling as he squeezed sharp pebbles by his spleen. Why? Why answer cruelty with cruelty? You have saved two lives. Why weigh down another's? And even when it was getting dark, the huntsman persisted. He was a brutal man with one eye socket that had been picked clean by a woodpecker. And when he could no longer see outside, he started putting in pieces of my granny's pottery, small bowls and china cups with pictures of cherries, milk glass swans and ceramic dancers with their arms upraised. Piece by piece, he wedged them into the wolf's wet insides, tiny squirrel figurines, and cherubs with harps. The wolf was silent the whole time. He stayed completely still and watched me with his big black eyes. Only once did I hear him murmur, and when I bent down to those great white teeth, I heard him say just one word, mercy. Eventually the huntsman was done. He went over to Granny's sewing box and took a needle and a thread to sew up the wolf's belly. He made big, ugly stitches that strained against the swollen pink skin. And then somehow the wolf managed to drag himself out of the cottage and down to the river. But what people don't know is that the wolf didn't drown that day, nor the next. He just lay there in the cold water with his paw holding on to a rock. He lay there with his swollen belly and his wet fur. He lay there motionless and gazed at the sky. I went to visit him most days, I, I don't know why. There was something about his stillness, his heaviness. We just sat together and listened to the water gurgling and watching the trees swaying in the breeze. And then one day the wolf said, I'm hungry. And it didn't strike me as strange because wolves are always hungry. It's their nature. But I didn't know what to feed him because I didn't want to kill another animal. So I reached into the river and pulled out a smooth stone. And without a word, the wolf opened his mouth and swallowed him. After that, I started feeding him a new stone every day. Uh, I searched everywhere. It became my mission, my passion, to find the best stones. I brought him shiny stones with bits of silver. I brought him small speckled stones that looked like bird's eggs. I brought him smooth stones and pitted stones and stones with rings. I brought him stones with stripes of color and ones that were jet black. I searched all over the countryside and into the woods. And as I got older, I took trains to new towns and found stones that had tumbled down mountains. In other countries, I found stones that had traveled in glaciers or been hacked out of mines. I found stones that had been in boys' pockets and stones that had been thrown during protests. And one day, when I was about the age Granny had been, I went to the river to find the wolf so weighed down with stones that only the tip of his nose and his eyes were still above the water. He was monstrously huge at this point, like a fallen tree, like a gray boulder. He filled the river from bank to bank, and only his tail still swished in the current. At that moment, I knew the story had to end. We both needed to let go. I took a pair of scissors and carefully cut the old stitches on the wolf's belly. And as soon as I did, the skin sprang back and the mountains heaved upward. I mean, stones heaved upward. There was a mountain of stones and I waded into the river and started taking them out. One by one, I reached in and I collected them. I piled them all around me, the shiny ones, the gray ones, the ones with holes, the smooth ones, 
and the ones like little embryos with their eyes just forming. It took me over a year, but finally I got close to his heart. And I started pulling out the original stones from Granny's garden and the china cups and the little squirrel figurines. I carefully pulled them all out and placed them around me. And when I pulled out the last one, the wolf heaved a huge sigh. His great body was empty. And without a word, he let go of the bank with his paw. He let go and instantly the current swept him downstream. He floated lightly and easily, his body turning in circles and rocking from side to side. He floated like a leaf, like a feather, like a torn page from a book. He floated down the river and out of sight. And as I watched him go, I thought that this, this is how the story should end. Wow. In 1945, she was barely alive, couldn't thrive, was deprived, outside and denied. This was the year the little match girl had arrived. This tale I know you know, how she died in the snow. Visions of a grandma in the match's bright glow. Makes you cry, makes you sigh that this girl had to die while the boots of the rich just walked on by. But if you look at the year and the cultural sphere, you see something else going on here. The rising rich believe the poor deserve what they got. It was their lot to not have squat, that they were morally shot. Their souls were as empty as an old piss pot. And down on Wall Street that year, there was a great conflagration, a fire conflagration, long duration, no sensation. It burned homes, businesses, and a banking corporation. The whole devastation couldn't have been speedier. And if you don't believe me, look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> so, so maybe that little girl wasn't really sad. Maybe that little girl just got mad. And her righteous ire from position so dire turned all of Wall Street into a funeral pyre. And maybe today's one percenters that take all that they can snatch might want to be a little more aware of the girl with the match. <laughs> I was always hungry. And when there's not enough food, your parents try to lose you in the woods. The first time we found our way home by scattering pebbles. But after that, stepmother bolted the door at night and we couldn't get any. So I collected crumbs. For weeks, when it was time to sweep, I put them in my apron. And then on the day we were taken back out to the woods, I dropped them behind me. But I had forgotten the birds, and soon they came in a rush, squawking and fighting. One raven, its eye like an old secret, paused long enough to regard me. He opened his mouth, and I thought he might say something, but he just grabbed some crumbs and flew away. So this time, when my parents sneaked off holding hands, we had no path to lead us back. The woods grew dark and we took turns crying into our knees. But when the sun came up, there was a delicious smell, a trail of something sweet just out of sight. We followed it and it filled the trees until we came to a clearing where unbelievably bright was a cottage made entirely of candy. Hansel didn't pause. He ran and leapt onto the gingerbread porch. Pulling off a shutter, he bit into it greedily, cracking both of his front teeth on the hard blue candy wood. I stayed by the trees and watched him. I knew about witches. My mother had told me about their tricks and their appetite for little children. And then when this one appeared after Hansel punched through a sugary window pane, when he, she stood hunched at the door with eyes like running sores, when she grabbed his arm and pulled him aside, I had just one moment to wonder why everything in the world was always so hungry. By the time I was in the cottage, she had Hansel in a cage. He howled and rolled, but she hung it from a hook in the ceiling. Then, unbelievably, she handed him a pie, a large fruity pie that hardly fit through the bars, and Hansel immediately started to eat. Good boy, and there'll be plenty more if you'll be quiet. I guess you think I should have run at this point, that I should have turned and run back into the woods, and perhaps I should have. But I wanted a pie, too. I wanted a warm fruit pie with a crisp glaze on the crust. I wanted a pie more than anything. So when the witch turned, I didn't flinch. I just held out my hands for a pie. She leaned very close to peer at me. Her eyes had pillows of pus in each corner. Oh, oh a girl, a hungry girl. Hungry girls work hard. You will help me feed your brother. And from that day on, I worked. I drew water from the well, I chopped wood for the fire, I swept and hauled, I cleaned and carried, and all day long the witch baked delicacies for Hansel. Sweet muffins with honey and bread with walnuts.
cakes with berries and cookies with nuts. And all day long, Hansel ate pies and sweetbreads, puddings and buns, tarts with fruit and pastries with figs. Hansel ate and ate and ate. He ate until his cheeks bloomed and waddles of flesh appeared on his arms. He ate until his legs grew round and layers of stack stacked on his, spat stacked on his belly. He took off his clothes when they didn't fit and sat naked, his flesh pushing through the bars and hanging in pink folds below. Sometimes I tried to reach in and get a bit of cookie he had missed or a piece of bread, but he always saw me and quickly snatched it. He no longer even spoke words, just made odd gasping gurgles around whatever he was chewing. In the mornings, the witch would approach the cage to see how plump Hansel was getting. Hold out your finger. Knowing that she could barely see, I'd hand Hansel a chicken bone for her to feel. She'd pinch it through the cage and grumble that he wasn't getting any fatter. Tomorrow, surely by tomorrow. This went on for a long time. The witch fed Hansel but gave me nothing. I felt cavernously empty like bones surrounding a deep pit. Sometimes I was so dizzy I thought I might fall into myself. However, I kept going because I was also burning. Somewhere deep inside was an angry heat that grew every day. It grew as I watched everything eat all around me. Hansel ate, and the witch ate, and the birds descended on the Graham Cracker roof. Their pecking was an endless clatter as they thrust their beaks through the ceiling. The squirrels gnawed the door, the mice ate through the floor, and the rats scurried past with sticky bricks in their teeth. And then one morning, the witch demanded I light the stone oven. I'm not waiting any longer. Today I cook your brother. And at this, I felt a furious heat spread through my veins. As she opened the oven door and leaned in, I threw myself against her body. I threw myself with such force she fell in all the way to her ankles. I then quickly slammed the heavy metal door. No! No! But I lit the fire. I lit the fire she wanted, and the oven immediately grew hot. The witch kicked at the metal door and screamed. I heard her rolling in there, thrashing. Her voice became a high-pitched shriek that sent the birds rushing off the roof. She shrieked and shrieked until I covered my ears. The rats and mice ran over each other to get out the door and to jump through the shungary window panes. I backed away from the oven, but still she kept shrieking, a high, piercing sound like a tin tea kettle with blood boiling inside it. I thought about running. I thought about the cool, dark woods. But just as I turned to the door, her shrieking stopped. The only sound was the fire crackling. I took a step tentatively to the oven. No sound. I took another couple of steps, and still it was quiet. I walked all the way to the oven door, and using a mitt, I slowly cracked it open. A dark cloud of smoke came billing out, and with it, the most incredible smell a deep, charred, meaty smell that made my mouth water. I opened the door wider and it enveloped me. A, a pungency, a roasted pungency that was unlike anything I'd ever breathed in. I closed the door and let it cook a little further. I listened to the hearty popping and hissing sounds. I made myself wait. It was many hours later when the fire had burned down that I took out the witch. Her skin had a burnt brownish glaze as I lay her on the table. The cottage was quiet with all of the animals scared away. I got a napkin and a cup of milk. And then all by myself, with no one to stop me, I ate her. I can't even tell you how I lost myself in this feast. At one point, I found myself up on the table in the middle of it, eating from all directions at once. It was only many hours later that I looked up. There was a strange sound, a low mewling, and at first I thought it was some of the rats. But when I turned around, it was Hansel. He sat, pressed against the back of the cage, and stared at me with wide eyes. I had forgotten all about him. I went all over, and he put up his hands in fear. He made a high, strangled sound. I got the key to the cage. It, it opened easily, but Hansel didn't come out. I offered my hand, but he shrank back. So I went to get another cup of milk. When my back was turned, he slid out and plopped to the floor. His legs didn't hold him up very well, and he half crawled to the door and lifted the latch. Where are you going, I asked. There is still so much to eat. He answered by heaving himself to his feet and pushing himself out the door. He then did a clumsy run all the way to the woods. I sometimes wonder if he made it home to my parents. I don't know. I never saw him again. As for me, I stood on the candy porch for a long time. Stars came out. The wind whistled in the surrounding woods. I knew that I wasn't going anywhere. I knew there was nowhere I even wanted to go. I knew I was going to stay right where I was because for the first time ever, 
I was finally full. You know who I am as soon as I jam Got a verbal assault by default from parole Listen to me now as I open the vault My sister was the good one, the fairy was impressed She was blessed by request with a singular behest Every time she spoke and for every word she speak A diamond or a jewel would fall to her feet She got the prince, went away to a castle with a moat Cause all a man really wants a girl with a talented throat But the fairy didn't like me, I wasn't kind, spoke my mind I declined to be refined, so she cursed my verse in a way so perverse Toads and vipers fall when I converse Oh, watch your feet there. <laughs> I got forked tongues coming from my lungs, eels from my larynx, vipers from my vocal cords, and when I curse, it just gets worse. You can't believe the depravity from my oral cavity. I walk into a bar, it's a verbal apocalypse. You can't believe the shit coming from my lips. Pythons, constrictors, the deadly black mamba, and if you piss me off, you get an anaconda. <laughs> so girls can keep their castle, can keep their prince. I got a deadly song that makes the whole world wince. This chorus from my orifice is done on porpoise. When I walk in, it's all going south. Because you just never know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> Thank you.